God is a God full of love and mercy, right? And in Genesis 12, we, we, we found out that he called a man named Abraham and he made the promise. What was the promise made to Abraham? Abraham, through your office spring, I'm going to have a great family. A multitude of people. And they're going to be a blessing for others. And then we read Exodus. And we found out that this promise took a long, 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 long time to be fulfilled. Instead of ending up in a beautiful land, they end up as slaves in Egypt. For how long? How long? Does anyone here remember? How long did they stay in Egypt? The one? Very good, over 400 years. Come on, God, when are you going to free us? We can't be slaves. We were supposed to be your people, to be in a place where we could be a blessing. Look at us. But as I said, God always fulfills his promises. And he calls a man called Moses. And he tells Moses, the time has come. Tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to free my people. As a businessman, Pharaoh thought, he reflected, how can I allow these slaves to live, financially speak? This is not a good idea. Economically speak, we, it's not good for business. No way, Moses. God sent ten plagues. And we read here to, together the last plague, the plague of death. The one that melted Pharaoh's heart and he allowed the people to go free. Last week, we read Joshua and we found out they were ready to get into the promised land. And today's text, it's about that land and God's people being a blessing to all their nations. And they chose a king for themselves. And God anointed this king. But this king called Saul, he messed up everything he did. He was not doing what he was doing for God. He was not being obedient. So now God calls another man to be the king of Israel. His name was David. Saul. Saul did not like the idea, Julia. And he begins to persecute David. And David needs to run away. Although he had already been anointed by God to be the king, Saul wanted to kill him. He didn't want to lose his power, his privilege. And we read in 1 Samuel, chapter 22, verse 1, that David left, left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. He runs away from Saul, who was not the king according to God anymore. He runs away. But let me tell you something else about this David. Do you know this David was a shepherd? He looked after sheep and he protected them with his own life. He killed lions, okay? He killed bears to protect animals. And he killed a giant as well, who was making fun of God's people. He killed a giant with his stones. Isn't he a brave man? I think David was a brave man. He was a man, a proper man, who didn't fear anything. He was ready to protect his animals. He was ready to protect his people. But what happened to this man? He's, he's running away from Saul, who was not the king, according to God anymore, John. Would you run away from someone who has been rejected by God? Was David a 
coward? Why would a brave man like David run from his enemy? Why didn't he fight Saul? You know what, Saul? I'm so sorry, I'm gonna kill you. You're not the king anymore, you're persecuting me. For the sake of protecting my own life, I'm gonna kill you. End of story. He doesn't do it. He runs away. He runs away. Why would David run away? David was not a coward running away from his enemy. He was actually, in my assumption, a wise man running towards God. When he went to the cave, he was not running from Saul. He was actually running towards God, to God's presence. Because God is the only one who could truly protect David. If God chose me, I know he's going to protect me. Did God ask David to kill Saul? No. So he was running to God. And here's the thing. David is a type of Christ, isn't he? Who did not use, Christ did not use his power to seek the destruction of his enemies. Jesus is God. He had all the power. He was actually the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the God's only chosen king. And he did not use his power to destroy his enemies. What did Jesus do actually? Well, let me just give you one example of what Jesus did. In Luke 23, verse 20, 34, he prays, he said, Father, when he was on the cross, okay, this is the context. Jesus is on the cross because he was placed there by his enemies, by those who hated him. And instead of being God at that moment and saying, you know, enough is enough, you hate me. Let me show you what I can do to you. And here's what he does. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Would you be able to do that? Would you be able to seek God's presence and open your mouth to pray for your enemies? What is the lesson here for us? Whenever we are tempted to seek the destruction of our enemies, we need to seek God's presence. Whenever deep inside you want to pay back, as I wanted to do today, you need to control yourself and think, okay, God, let me get into your presence. Let me actually pray. And that's what I did here today with some, someone who was actually trying to remove me. And I said, she was crying. I said, you know what? Can I pray for you? I'm not Christian. I didn't ask you if you're a Christian. I just asked you, can I pray for you? She said, yes. Let's turn to God in prayer. Let's seek God's presence. Alex, how can we do that in practice? Next time your enemy provokes you, curses you, persecutes you, do not open your mouth to attack them with hate. Control yourself. Don't use your mouth to <laughs> do the same, to curse. But open up your mouth to pray for them. Say, God, you know that in my heart, oh, I want to do horrible things. But can you help me here? Can you help me to have mercy for them? Alex, this is too much. I know, I know, I know. But if Jesus did, we need to do as well. Second, 
We need to seek God's presence, but we also need to love God's people. I love this Bible passage. Here's what it says from verse 1b to verse 4. Soon his brothers, David's brothers, and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble, or in debt, or who were just discontent. Unto David was the captain of about 400 men. Later, David went to Mizpah. Moab, where he asked the king, please allow my father and mother to live here with you until I know what God is going to do for me. So David's parents stayed in Moab with the king during the entire time David was living in his stronghold. Again, let's get the context. God has asked Samuel to anoint David as a king. So wants to kill David because he doesn't want, he doesn't want to have David as a king. Dave runs to a cave and people hear about that. All sort of people, people who had a lot of problems. His family, his relatives, 400 men. And they be, became the captain, the leader of all these troubled people. Question, why would a man full of problems lead people full of problems? If I have problems, that's the last thing I want is to be surrounded by people full of problems. If life is difficult, the last thing I want it's more difficulties on my way. I want to hide from them. I don't want to be the captain of distressed people. Didn't David have enough trouble for himself? Why more, David? Come on, take a break. Take a kind of holiday in this cave. Do not worry about those who are in the same situation as you are. Was that what David did? Why? Well, David had a mind full of problems, but also a heart full of love for those in need of help. He would never say no to those people. He would not never say, you know what? You're drawing too much attention, okay? I'm running away from Saul. And now look, man, you've got, you've got too many people in this cave. You draw too much attention. Did he do that? No. The only thing he did was, okay, my parents, they are very old. So let me talk to the king of Moab and ask him to look after them. But all the rest, come with me. I know how it is to be in your shoes. I know how difficult life is. And I'm here to help you, although I need help. David, again, is a type of Christ, who did not come to be served, but to serve those who need. Mark 10, 45, Jesus clarifies that. I did not come to be served, but to serve as a ransom for many. Jesus had no reason to come. Okay, as I keep saying, the planet Earth is not a good place for a God to come on holiday, okay? It's not a good place. But he came not to be served, but to serve. That was not in my notes. But in Luke 4, Mark, Matthew 4, Jesus is in the wilderness, right? For 40 days, 40 nights, fasting, praying, and being tempted by the devil. After 40 days, Satan comes and he turns to Jesus and he says, Turn this stone into a loaf of bread. Question, what is the sin? Okay, tell me, because I've been trying to find in the Bible, what is the sin of turning stones into bread if you have the power of doing it? What is the sin of it? What is wrong with it? Honestly, honestly, okay? 
okay, Lucas, you tried to find it. No? <laughs> nothing wrong with it. There is, it's not a sin. Why didn't he do it then? Because Jesus never used his power for his own benefit. He would rather listen to God, rely on God. That's why he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. I'm not going to rely even on my own strength. I'm going to rely on the strength of the Father who sent me. He did not come to be served, but to serve, to die as a ransom. What is the lesson for us? Whenever you get distressed by your enemies, instead of opening your heart to hate them, because that is the temptation, someone does something bad to you, your enemy does something bad to you, you open your heart to hate. Instead of doing that, open your heart to love them and to serve those around you. I, I mean, I've been doing this for more than 10 years, planting church. And this is what I see all the time. As soon as people get into trouble, they stop serving others. Ah, no, 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 Alex, when my life was good, I wanted you to love others. But now life is too hard, and nah, nah, I can't think about others. Did Jesus do that? Life was hard, and he was still loving them. On the cross, he still loved them. So why? Why in distress you're going to stop serving others? What can we do in practice? Next time your enemy provokes, curses, or persecutes you, do not allow their hate to contaminate your heart. Don't let their hate to turn your emotions in the same way. Instead, use love in your heart to serve a friend in need of help, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people who need your help. I'm sure. So don't lose focus. Don't focus on your enemy. Focus on what you can do to others around you. Thirdly and lastly, submit to God's word. This is hard. Okay, this is the hard part. So pay attention. If you did not listen to what I said, that I want you to pay attention to this last point, okay? Verse 5. Are you all with me? Yeah. yeah? One day, the prophet God told David, Leave the stronghold and return to the land of Judah. So David went to the forest of Hiram. Context. David is running away from Saul who wants to kill him. He's in this cave, he becomes the captain of more than 400 men. He's safe, he's protected, he's got little army around him. Now the prophet comes and says, um, David, I think it's time for you to face Saul. Basically, that's what he's saying. I think you need to get closer to Saul who wants to kill you. Right? You get me here? Get, get closer to the one who wants to kill you. What kind of a device is that, Santa? Okay, your pastor comes to you and says, Okay, Santa, I know there is someone who wants to harm you, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to live next door to this person. <laughs> what would you say? Are you crazy, Alex? No way. This is nonsense. Why would David risk his life? Why would he do it? Is my assumption. David was afraid of Saul, okay? However, he feared the Lord more than anybody else. A prophet was speaking on behalf of God. The prophet comes to David and said, Here's what God wants you to do. And David obeyed. Because he feared the Lord more than anybody else. 
again, Dave is a type of Christ who did not obey the desires of the flesh of his heart, but God's plan. It doesn't make sense, prophet, but if God asks me to do so, I'm going to obey. His will doesn't need to be a good thing. His plans don't look like a good plan, but I am going to obey. Just as Jesus did. Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus was about to die, okay? He's praying, and drops of blood comes out of him. Just to, just to give you the idea of the anxiety he was facing, the fear he was facing, knowing that he was going to be rejected by the elders, he was going to be beaten, crucified on a cross, and he prays. He went a little on further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will be done, not mine. Your plan, God, is too hard. The suffering that I'm going to face is too hard. But your will, not mine. I want to be obedient to your plan, not my heart. Lesson for us. Whenever we are distressed by our enemies, we cannot obey our heart's desires, but God's desires. It is difficult to obey God. It is. It is. Let's, let's be honest. It's not easy. It's very difficult. How can we then do that in practice? Next time your enemy provokes, curses, or persecutes you, do not open your mind to plan an attack. Revenge, attack. Stop using your mind to increase the amount of hate in your heart. Instead, open your mind to, number one, take notes if you can. <laughs> Get to know the Bible. Okay, I keep saying that Sunday after Sunday, and I'm going to be repeating that because that's one of our values. If you want to be part of Mosaic, you need to understand that we are a biblical church. So if you don't like the Bible, if you don't like reading the Bible, this place is not going to be a good place for you. So I need you to get to know your Bible. I need you to open it every day the same way you eat. Read the Bible, please. Alex, I find it very difficult. Well, of course it is difficult. It is difficult to know God because you know that by knowing Him, you would have to obey Him. It's not difficult to read, actually. It's difficult to obey. And that's the second thing. I want you to submit to it. Read the Bible and say, it doesn't make sense, I'm going to submit to it. This is going to have the final authority in my life. If the Bible, if the Bible is not your final authority, again, Mosaic is not a place for you. I don't believe in the Bible. Well, you are not using your time wisely. Because coming here to get to know God, we're going to do it by using the Bible. So I need you to submit, not to Alex. Have I ever asked you to trust me here? Santa, have I ever asked you to trust me here? Did I ask you to trust me here, Junior? John? Don't trust me, right? Don't trust me. Trust the Bible. Because if I say something here that is not in the Bible, I want you to kick me out. Because you submit to the Bible. Right? Thirdly and lastly, 
You get to know God by reading the Bible, you submit to His will, not your will, and then you put into practice. Obey it. Obey it. Obey it. To conclude, hate will never be destroyed from our hearts and minds by having our enemies destroyed. You know what? You can destroy one enemy. Do you know what's going to happen? Another one will come. Because we live in a broken world. You can't keep destroying your enemies. Okay, if you're good at church history, uh, in history, you know that wars, they never solve the problem, right? You just increase the number of enemies you're going to have. So we don't, we don't get rid of hate by destroying our enemies. On the contrary, hate can only be destroyed through love. The same love Jesus demonstrated towards us when he died for us. Here's the thing, when he died for us, huh? come on, when he died for us, why we were still his enemies, you were his enemies. Do you understand that? That's why Jesus died on a cross. You were his enemies. You were separated from him. And what did he do? Did he destroy us? No. He died for us. Never forget that. Okay? Never forget that. That's what it means to, to God to love you. He loved you in a such a way that you were, you were his enemies and he sent his son. Questions. Are you going to seek the destruction of your enemies or God's presence? Next time you face something that I had to face in the morning, are you going to <laughs> seek the destruction of someone who is full of hate? Or are you going to control yourself, seek God's presence, pray, saying, okay, God, help me here. Help me here. Can you help me to actually love this person? Are you going to use your heart to hate your enemies or to love those in need? Are you going to keep focusing on hate, on your problems? Or are you going to use your energy to do good, to love others? Are you going to submit and obey hate? Oh, this is a good one, isn't it? Are you going to submit to hate or to love? Are you going to submit to your own selfish, sinful desires or to God, God's will? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because Although we were your enemies, you sent your only and begotten Son to die on the cross so we could become your friends, so we could become part of your family, Father. However, you know how hard it is for us to love those who hate us. You know how difficult it is for us having this sinful nature that we still have to imitate your son, Father. So we, we pray before you, asking you to please help us through your Holy Spirit to love our enemies, Father, in the same way you love them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.